of the community. I'm Jose Sanders, and I'm very happy to be your host for one more in our series of town halls. We have a very important conversation for you, and we hope that you will find it as interesting as we have before we started rolling. <laughs> this is going to be a good one. There are nine historically Black Greek letter organizations, uh, BGLOs, that make up the National Pan Hellenic Council. Collectively, these organizations are referred to as the Divine Nine. Each of these fraternities and sororities is rich in history, ties to one or more of these organizations may be found in many college educated black families in the United States. Alpha Alpha Fraternity, founded in 1906, Cornell University. Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity, founded in 1911, Indiana University. Omega Psi Phi Fraternity, founded in 1911 at Howard University. Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity, founded in 1914 at Howard. Iota Phi Theta Fraternity, founded in 1963 at Morgan State University. We have so much to cover in this little short hour, so we're going to get started. We have some illustrious gentlemen joining us today, and uh, if you'll indulge me, I'm going to read all of their bios, because it's it's worth it. Let me introduce our guests. First of all, we have Mr. Rufus Williams, Jr., who is the Managing Director of Loop Wealth, the personal wealth management business arm of Loop Capital, focuses on building generational wealth for ultra high income athletes, entertainers, artists, and executives. That's why we're just friends. We don't do business because I'm an <laughs> ultra <laughs> We'll on he, he founded Olympus LLC. That's a boutique client or representation firm, uh, primarily serving athletes and entertainers a broad range of services, including contract representation, business management, investment management. He also served as a CFO for Oprah Winfrey's Harpo Incorporated and was corporate audit manager at Baxter Healthcare after spending 10 years at Arthur Anderson. He has a long standing commitment to civic engagement and education demonstrated by his service as president of Chicago's Board of Education, the nation's third largest school system. He's also been a consistent leader on boards of several of the city's top schools and civic organizations. A life trustee of Francis W. Parker School, he served as vice chairman and treasurer of Providence St. Mel School and was president of the local school council of Whitney Young Magnus School. He has a long and rich involvement with the Better Boys Foundation, most recently serving as president and CEO. He's from Cap Outside. Here's Mr. Rupes Wood. Good to see you, sir. It's great to see you, Jose. Thank you for that um, for that background. I didn't know you did that much research on me. <laughs> you know what we do, how we do it. You know what? Some of this I knew already. Some of this is say what? <laughs> well, thank it's you for that. Day. <laughs> Next, we have Mr. Daryl Williams. He's managing business partner at Loop Capital. Uh, having uh, joined that firm in 2007, bringing over 35 years of strategic governance and financing experience toward the successful provision of investment banking and financial advisory services to Loop Capital clients and partners. Prior experience include providing investment banking services to Dean Winter Reynolds and in the merger acquisition and divestiture groups at First National Bank of Chicago and Ameritech Corporation. In addition, Daryl has served on multiple private sector not-for-profit boards of directors and currently serves on the board of Amalgamated Bank of Chicago, City Colleges of Chicago and its foundation, the Chicago Center for Art and Technology, One Goal Chicago, and the Coleman Entrepreneur Center at DePaul University, a life member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Daryl has a business, a Bachelor of Science degree from DePaul University, a Master of Administration from the Howard University Graduate School of Business, and the bell is ringing because that's my friend. Hey, Daryl. <laughs> Good to see you, sir. We got it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. No, no, we, we got next Mr. Cedric Jones, who is a consultant with uh, Naksubi Chicago Consulting Group. Professional career began with Arthur Anderson and then with the uh, Hallmark Development Company. And uh, he, uh, he had his career in real estate began rooted in large community changing projects. While at Homart, he became the CFO of Sears HQ Development Project in Hoffman Estates. That was the largest corporate relocation in the country at the time. He was currently working as a consultant, advising on multi-billion dollar real estate development projects here in Chicago, and also 
in Oakland, California. Common thread and theme on all these projects, bringing equity to our community. He has also been able to leverage his business and work experiences to be a member of a few organizations like Francis Xavier Ward Facilities Committee and Chicago Professional Chapter of the National Association of Black Accountants. He is part of the Lynn Bloom High School Alumni Network, and he is a proud member of Phi Beta Sigma. Hey, Cedric. Thank you, Jose. Great introduction. Great to be on the panel with these distinguished gentlemen. Uh, look forward to the conversation. Great to have you with us, sir. Next, we have Dr. Dennis Deer who has served as Cook County Commissioner of the Second District since 2017, one of the most diverse districts, of course, in Cook County. It includes Austin, Inglewood, East and West Garfield, North Lawndale, Little Italy, Noble Square, River North, Washington Park, South Loop, West Loop communities, plus the Michigan Avenue business, uh, business, what is that? Business of Chicago Theater and Illinois Medical District. You got a lot, doctor. I'm trying to get through it. He's born and raised on Chicago's West Side. He is a servant leader, passionately dedicated to North Lawndale community, working to impact positive change. He is a certified rehabilitation counselor, licensed clinical professional counselor, and he has combined his uh, passion for community and returning to North Lawndale up to 20 years. He founded Deer Rehab Services, Inc. That's one of the most well-regarded providers of comprehensive services for ex-offenders. As an Illinois Law Enforcement Standards and Training Board certified instructor, Dr. Deer went on to start the Law Enforcement Family Training Services. He extends his work with nonprofit organizations like Strategic uh, Human Services and North Lawndale Community Coordinating Council, which he co-founded. He, uh, the Illinois Department of Human Services, Domestic Violence Advisory Council, Partner Abuse Intervention Program Subcommittee, and his executive steering committee. He is vice president of Illinois Coalition Against Domestic Violence. And he is a proud member of Omega Sci Fi, Dr. Dennis Deer. How you doing? Pleasure, pleasure. It's, it's good to be here. Thanks good. for having me. Good to see you, my friend. Good to and see we you. Also have Dr. Derek J. Robinson he is vice president, chief medical officer for Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Illinois. He is responsible for care management operations, clinical leadership, and strategic oversight in providing high value health care to more than <clears throat> 8 million members. He's also the founding chair of the Health Equity Steering Committee, which was established to develop health equity strategies across markets and lines of business. Uh, for nearly two decades, he has led community efforts to promote diversity and inclusion for undergraduate and postgraduate education at the local, state, and national level. He is a member of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Committee at the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education. Dr. Robinson is Vice Chairman of the Board of Trustees at Xavier University in Louisiana, clinically active and board certified in emergency medicine. He holds degrees from Xavier and uh, Howard University and the University of Chicago. He is an adjunct faculty member with North Western University, and he is a member of Kappa Alpha Psi. Good to see you, Dr. Robinson. Good to be here with you, Jose. Thank you for the opportunity. Good to see you, sir. Now, uh, we, we all have us, at the time we were broadcasting this, we were not able to locate somebody in this particular time period from IOTA. Uh, I want to give a little information about IOTA Phi Theta Fraternity. Uh, they were founded in uh, September 1963, Morgan State University in Baltimore, now initiated over 30,000 members. They have a rich history of service, both attorney in the city of Chicago, recognizing the decades old relationship with Sigma Omega chapter, graduate chapter. Many leaders continue on to become uh, in charge of the Sigma Omega. This mission and service continues today, centered around uh, social action, action initiatives and in and for black community, form of social service projects, to worthy causes from volunteering to activism. We want to represent them and give a shout out to our older brothers as well. Now, we want to start this conversation. Now we know who you are. I got this formal thing over. That's the hardest thing we're going to do all day. But I got to let people know who we're talking with and who we're dealing with here today. So having gotten the formalities out of the way, I want to start with everybody and, and talk to you each about why you decided to pledge in the first place and what your particular organization means to you. And I'm gonna start with Rufus. Well, growing up in Chicago, uh, Kappa was very prominent, very dominant. Herb Kent 
Uh, we were listening to WVON and heard Ken always talked about going down to Kappa Carnival at Southern Illinois University. And I couldn't wait the Kappa Carnival. So uh, recognizing as well, I have an older cousin who I admired who went to Grambling and he pledged Kappa there. So um, when I got to Southern, I went to Southern in Baton Rouge. And when I got to Southern, really the people that I was around were not that up on, on fraternities. And so I, on my own, as I do, I kind of looked around and the first group that I saw pledging were the brothers of uh, Omega Psi Phi, or the Sphinxmen, um, their pledgees. And this was back in the 70s, Jose. So I had a, I had a nice Afro. Had the fro. Had the fro. And I saw these guys and they had an Omega cut into their head. And I said, oh, this will never happen for me. <laughs> there's no way anybody's touching this fro. So that was all done. And then about a year or so later, as I got more acclimated to the campus, got more involved on my own, and I really started to uh, pay more attention to the fraternities and watch what was going on. It just felt that, you know, Kappa and what Kappa was doing felt good to me. And so um, in spite of where I may have been steered, because there were some, some lovely AKAs who were talking to me about pledging Alpha, <laughs> and I probably told them that I would, but my heart, where my heart should have been, and I pledged Kappa Alpha Psi, and I've had not one moment of regret since. Well, all right, sir. I appreciate that. You know, we could have had you, but you know, you went a good way as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm. I think I'm in the right. I'm in the right <laughs> place. <laughs> let's let's go with Derek uh, right now and see what's going on. How, why'd you decide to play it? You know, I was really attracted to the, the Kappas on campus at Xavier University. I'll start by saying I'm a native of Shreveport, Louisiana, and the grandson of sharecroppers. And so we didn't have a lot of college graduates in the family. Uh, and I did not have a lot of exposure to fraternities and sororities growing up. So this was new to me besides watching school days, you know, <laughs> coming along. Um, but the, the Kappas on Xavier's campus were doing some, some really extraordinary work. I really admire their, their leadership. And there are a number of faculty members that were also uh, influential in my decision. And, you know, this year I'm celebrating 25 years of membership uh, in Kappa Alpha Psi. And, uh, you know, I love the fraternity has given so much to me uh, over the years and really has helped broaden the aperture through which I see life and, and opportunities. Um, and I think I've not had so many individuals that really poured into me when I was a young, young Kappa. I probably would not have achieved many of the things that I have uh, achieved today. So I'm very grateful uh, for the experience of membership and for all the things that others have contributed to me. Well said, sir. <laughs> Let the Zoom say amen. <laughs> amen. <laughs> amen. <laughs> Let's go to Cedric now. Uh, uh, I grew up here in Chicago on the west side of Chicago. Uh, That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> and what influenced me was uh, our great first black mayor was a Sigma. And I heard him speak. And then when I went off to college down in uh, Southern Illinois, a lot of the brothers down there that played Sigma were from Limbloom. And Limbloom is kind of a tight network. And they kind of took me under their arms uh, and talked to me. It took me a year to, to come to grips with pledging. Somebody telling me what to do, when to do it. And, and I go back, that was probably the best. I got my best grades and I was the most focused during the time I pledged because they, you know, the, the focus was on education, making yourself a better man and being prepared to have a positive impact on, uh, on, on the, on life after college. So that's what really drew me to, you know, Phi Beta Sigma forever. The sum of it all, Mr. Williams. <laughs> I'll start. I'm trying to be good. I'm trying hard to be good. <laughs> Let's go to commissioner. You, Absolutely. You, you represent it, you hard. <laughs> uh, no doubt. Always, always. And it, it is a pleasure to talk about my beloved fraternity. You know, I say that the person that had the most impact on me, he is uh, deceased now. God bless his soul. Uh, Brother Robert Steele. Uh, he was the predecessor before I became commissioner. But all the way back in high school, he was the he was a man's man. He was the Q's Q. Right. And so. He uh, excelled, but also kind of introduced me to Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity Inc. early on. And um, he continued, obviously, to pull at my coattail. And I saw all the great work that he was doing. And uh, eventually I said, all right, it's time for it. 
and I became a man of Omega Psi Phi, which is the greatest fraternity in all of the earth. And so we're very, very thankful. Listen, we're in Black History Month. Guess who created Black History Month? A man of Omega Psi Phi, Carter G. Woodson. He also wrote Miseducation of a Negro. And so it started out as Achievement Week, and we've, we, we've helped grow it into Black History Month. And so we're all about doing what's necessary to serve mankind, to promote Blackness in our communities, to be in our communities helping to infiltrate uh, where we have no economic development, to bring in economic development there, but also being a help to every single person in that community. And I think I love that the most. I think we are the most service-oriented organization out there. We've been involved in the COVID stuff. We've been involved in helping people make sure they get vaccinated. Now we are getting rid of the myths that are out there about getting vaccinated. So uh, long live Omega Sci Fi fraternity. Well, I see we're gonna have to mute the commissioner for the rest of this call. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> He's a no, hey, hey, already no, hey. stepped out, bro. <laughs> 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 People down the road, they're the best on earth. They're all this. Oh. You know, all, all the way, all the way. Yeah, they do the best service of everybody. He he started some stuff, so it's about to hey. Happen. Well, first first of all, service of all, Daryl, bring it home for us. <laughs> right. All right, brother Jose. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for uh, having us here. This is truly an honor. I'm I'm happy to be um, uh, part of this great discussion with such fantastic uh, gentlemen here. Um, you save the best for last. Alpha Phi Alpha is the oldest and the coldest. <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> as you said, uh, 1906, we started. But you know, my uh, journey to uh, Alpha Phi Alpha um, started in college. Uh, I had not a lot of exposure. In fact, my biggest role, mo role models were Kappas. Um, and, and I thought highly of them and I thought perhaps I would, uh, pledge Kappa if I, if I, uh, got to that point, but I went through my entire four years at DePaul university, um, not, um, uh, you know, pledging, uh, we didn't have, uh, African-American fraternities on campus at the time. Um, but, you know, after my senior year, um, toward the end of my senior year, uh, Alpha Phi Alpha came around and um, I did some study. And, you know, once I did some study, uh, it was pretty clear to me. Um, and this is from everyone from, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, to every brother that, that is part of a community organization, um, you know, making it happen wherever they are. Uh, I, I, I just thought, I just saw commitment to community. I saw a commitment to betterment, uh, both self-betterment and community betterment. And for those reasons, I pledged. Now I pledged, even though I had just graduated from college, I pledged undergrad um, because, uh, because everyone, there was, a, there was a reputation if you pledged graduate school right after getting out of undergrad. And so, uh, and so, you know, I was wearing my lavalier uh, underneath my suit at First National Bank of Chicago. Uh, and and <laughs> it's one of the best moves I ever made. <laughs> it was hiding while you played it. We play as hard back then too. <laughs> we play as hard. hard. We play. Yeah, we were a charter line, uh, Brother Sanders. And so every brother in the Chicago metropolitan area wanted to meet us. Right. Um, <laughs> just, just a correction, Rufus. It's the Sphinxman Club is uh, those who are pledging Alpha Phi Alpha. And mm -hmm. The lamps are the cues. My the bad. The cues. <laughs> Thank you. And everybody want to talk about the cues. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the and the Actually, that's true. We do want to talk about the cues. Go on, Jeffrey. Yeah. yeah. I, I can relate to that. Uh, when I when I was playing, I played at Henderson State University, uh, and mm -hmm. I did, uh, you know, uh, fall something something way way back. <laughs> and I was playing, and I had a trip to come uh, to a journalism convention while I was undergrad to Chicago. I remember being terrified. You know, I actually 
hit my thing too, because I'm saying I'm not stepping off that plane and, <laughs> and having to pledge all the way up and down the streets of Chicago. You know, <laughs> but I, I can relate to that. We were, you were starting, we was dropping some names, Commissioner started. Uh, go through, I want everybody to go through and let some people know who are some of the members. I want to start with Rufus, some of the members of your organization. Yeah, I'll just say this, as soon as Dennis started throwing out names, I knew Martin Luther King was going to come up. <laughs> yeah, as soon as one of the alphas talked, Martin Luther King. Um, you know, I got more. <laughs> as, as we all, as we all do, as we all do. <laughs> you know, from actually, Jose, what I'd like to do, I want to defer to Derek, and I'm gonna, I'll backstop him uh, with the with some of these illustrious capitals that we have um, in our midst. Derek, why don't you take that now? Sure, I, I'd be happy to jump in. And, and Jose, what I'll do is I'll walk through some of the illustrious, cap, illustrious capitals that folks know that I've had a chance to meet that helped kind of shape my path. So I think Real about individuals like Dr. Bernard Harris, who is a, a physician and the first uh, African-American to walk in space, someone that I had a chance to see as an undergraduate helped me better see you know, myself in the future as becoming a physician. Uh, stalwart leaders like Congressman, the late Congressman John Conyers, one of the co-founders of the Congressional uh, Black Caucus. Uh, Johnny Cochran, famous attorney that we all know of, native of Shreveport, Louisiana, had a chance to meet him uh, on, on several occasions. You know, just to, to be around individuals who've had such a significant uh, impact in society, especially for you know, a, a young man, you know, you're wet behind, behind the ears, you're trying to get your life started. Those are tremendously influential um, experiences. And so um, I'll name those as just a few and, and pass it to Rufus. Yeah, and I'll, I'll jump back in and I'll kind of go through a quick short list. But if we're talking about sports, certainly in Chicago, then we can't miss Gail Sayers, who was a good Kaepernick man. And we can't miss Colin Kaepernick, who was um, impacted society in ways in which we can't otherwise see. Uh, there's also Arthur Ashe, who many have heard of, Will Chamberlain, Bill Russell. If we're talking about business, we're talking about Reginald Lewis, uh, who bought Beatrice L B uh, TLC. We're talking about Bob Johnson uh, from BET, Lester McKeever, locally, Captain Man. In law, there's James Montgomery. Um, Derek mentioned Johnny Cochran. There's also a brilliant lawyer, Earl B. Dickerson, who was responsible for a number of things here in Chicago, <coughs> including Burr Oak Cemetery and, and otherwise. In education, um, Kenneth Clark, who was one who did the experiment with the uh, dolls back in, in uh, leading up to Brown versus the Board of Education. There's Warwick Carter, who ran, um, ran um, Columbia College in entertainment. Currently, Cedric the Entertainer, John Singleton, nephew Tommy is a new. So if you get one of those prank calls, you'll know, uh, you know who's, who's doing that. Uh, Kwame Raul, Tom Bradley, John Carters, uh, the only man who's ever quoted Biggie Smalls on the floor of the U U.S. government, Hakeem Jeffries, is also a brother of Kappa Alpha Psi. Um, we've got in media, uh, actually, the brother who started the Chicago Defender, um, Robert Singstack Abbott is a cap as a brother of Kappa Alpha Psi. Jim Calvin Butts from Abyssinian Church in, in Harlem. Uh, Reverend Leon Finney recently passed is also a brother of Kappa Alpha Psi. Uh, Lerone Bennett in literature. And so just to name a few. Um, a few? A few. A few. Just name a few. <laughs> we've, got a, we've got a list. You went down a few, few were called. <laughs> a few. Hey, who's, who's left? Who's left? <laughs> Let's hear about some singers. Are you asking me to go? Are you asking me to no, go? No, no, don't, no, no. Don't ask him. Don't, don't let him go anymore. <laughs> we're going to mute Rufus now. <laughs> yeah, let's oh, mute yeah. Rufus. If you'd like for me to, I can continue. Yeah, no. <laughs> oh. Cedric, come on, give us, give us some singers. So I'm going to start a little different. Somebody that, you know, a lot of the older guys on the phone, on, on the Zoom call will no, it's The Temptations, Otis Wilson, <laughs> Otis Williams, and Melvin Franklin from The Temptations, The Tempting <laughs> Temptations, okay? A. Philip Randolph, George Washington Carver, John Lewis, you know, Huey Newton, and Bobby Seale, The Black Panthers, okay? <laughs> really, let's, let's, Harold Washington, Ben Chavis, you know, we actually, this is gonna be interesting, we actually have a president, honorary William Jefferson Clinton. Yes, we do. <laughs> Al Sharpton. I'll show at the search file. 
Uh, and Smith. Uh, good, good, good. Jerry White. So we'll let you get him back a little bit later. <laughs> You know what? We have learned to ignore omegas. They're at the end of the alphabet. They're at the end, all right? <laughs> and then, you know, locally, we have Dr. Robert Jones, who's the chancellor of U of I. Yeah. We actually have Alan uh, Leroy Locke, the first black world <laughs> scholar. So just, just a few. We don't want to keep going on and on. Lord, why did I ask this question? What? <laughs> That's a good question. Commissioner, give us give us a few. Give us a few. I mean, let me give you a few. I, I gave you a couple already. Yeah. But you know, us cues, we like to go all out. Uh, right. So I'm, I'm gonna give you a couple people uh, who impacted my life today. <clears throat> Brother Eric Gilkey, who is with Romeo Mew Q, he's on the west side. Uh, that's our chapter on the west side. Brother Willie Edwards is doing such a great job mentoring me uh, on, on the west side. But let me go a little bit further. So Michael Jordan was a Q, in case you didn't know, right? Shaquille O'Neal is a Q. You all also got up there the Reverend, the wonderful Reverend, Jesse Jackson. See, us Qs, we don't play around, right? We get to the top of the game, and then we control the game, right? <laughs> it's, it's part of us being... Men of Omega Sci Fi. You got Dr. David Satcher, Benjamin Mays, Charles Drew, uh, Vernon Jordan. And guess what? While you quoting them Langston Hughes poems, he was a Q2. Well, all right. All right. We got, okay. We got, I'm a, I got to, I got to give Gerald just a, just a couple more. And then, because we could do this whole thing. <laughs> all night. <laughs> Represent us just a couple more there, and we'll move on to some more questions. Sure, sure. So, uh, I'm particularly fond of Charles Hamilton Houston. Um, he, he is known as the killer of Jim Crow. He's the one who came to the NAACP to set up the entire strategy that culminated in Brown versus Board of Education. Of course, uh, the Honorable Brother Thurgood Marshall was his uh, student um, in the fight for equality in the fight before the Supreme Court. Locally, we have some incredibly illustrious members of the fraternity, starting with um, Brother Mayor um, Eugene Sawyer. We have uh, the first Black Attorney General and the first Black Treasurer, uh, Brother Roland Burst. Um, we have uh, the recently elevated Speaker of the House of Representatives, uh, Brother Emmanuel Welch. Um, we have United States Congressman Danny Davis who is one of seven uh, alphas in, in Congress, um, including the new uh, senator from, um, uh, from Atlanta. Atlanta. Yeah. Atlanta. We're not. Um, we, in business, there is, uh, of course, the founder of Ebony Jet Magazine, John H. Johnson. The market there, style. Uh, uh, some of our contemporaries, brothers Lyle Logan and Shundron Thomas, who are very, very senior in uh, Wall Street. Uh, Brother Bret Hart, president of United Airlines. Brother um, Donald Thompson, former chief executive officer of McDonald's. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna end it, I'm gonna stop there. Yeah, let's, let's, uh, we, we could go, you and I could go on and on, you know what I mean? <laughs> Oh, here we go, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's some bias going on. That's the, only, that's the only time I'm gonna do it. Okay, I'm gonna remain. <laughs> <laughs> impartial okay now gentlemen i want to talk okay. to you. Okay. can i ask what i'm sorry before you go off, before you go off the topic I, I think it would be good for those of us and, and those who would watch if we can name out some of the iotas that we know to give them some homage while we're talking about where we are now and you know as we started there was certainly a mention of um, of congressman bobby rush as mm -hmm. being a brother of uh, yes. of iota and if you guys know some others that you could just throw out just to give them to as we do this, uh, have this conversation, I think that would be good too. That's my list. But you got that from me. I did, thank you. Did <laughs> you? But there's also your cousin. Uh, I'm gonna I'm a, I'm a, I'm a yeah. for a minute. Uh, we have, uh, we talked about history and we all have <laughs> this history, but let's talk about what we're doing today and, and, and why it's important for these organizations 
uh, to have a place in today's dialogue, the conversation. What are we doing to advance the cause today? I want anybody who wants to jump in on this and tell why these organizations are important in today's world. Okay, so, I'll, so, I'll, I'll jump in and, and, and start there. I mean, we've all talked about our experience as undergraduates and and certainly there's a real important you know, focus of our fraternities on supporting universities and education being a, um, an empowering and liberating uh, tool for, for our communities. Um, but also, you know, we're active as alumni members of these fraternities in our communities today. Um, Chicago happens to have the distinction of housing the very first alumni chapter in Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated's history, the Chicago alumni chapter. Um, our brothers are very involved in the community. We have our Edward G. Irvin <laughs> Foundation Center in the Woodlawn community, where our senior Kappas, those that are oldest, you know, several years ago identified food insecurity in the Woodlawn area as being um, a real opportunity to contribute. And so they started a food pantry, uh, which successfully, you know, fed up to 10,000 individuals a month. And when the pandemic hit, that stopped. And so these senior Kappas were like, they, they knew the impact that they were having in the community around food insecurity. We restarted that during the summer and really doubled down on some partnerships to ensure that during this time when folks are really feeling the heaviest economic impact, you know, from the pandemic, that we continue to be able to serve in that particular uh, capacity and resume that efforts. And then certainly we've done a tremendous amount of work in the area of, of mentoring, working with uh, young people across the city. Um, so it's a really important role for our fraternities in society today, building on the legacy of our founders, you know, because these are individuals who you know, especially for Cap Alpha Psi on a predominantly white campus in 1911, there were not a lot of uh, African Americans there, but they really knew that it was important um, right. to really fight for their places there to ensure that they also had a ladder for individuals coming behind them. And so, you know, as we rise up to uh, positions of influence in society, we have to ensure that we're supporting individuals in our communities so that they have those opportunities as well. There's a big question today, gentlemen, if these organizations are indeed relevant today are they are they just social organizations a whole lower from our campus days and we still want to you know hang on to that brotherhood but rather not doing good in the hood if you will you know what i mean is it are they really as important as we think they are so let me let me let me chime in here they are important uh certainly they keep on the camaraderie but remember and we all joke with each other and that's all mm -hmm. fine. But the divine nine, we all come together and do service to our community at the yes. end of the day. We laugh and we talk and we joke, but we all are about the business. Uh, when you talk about, I'll go, I'll, now I'll jump back to a million now. Um, so, so what I say is a lot of what I have learned in Omega is stuff that I practice today, right? So I practice it in my role as a commissioner. I know that black people uh, is always looking for something to celebrate, but we want to celebrate the right thing. So myself and a, a alpha brother, brother Stanley Moore, we came together and we introduced Juneteenth as a Cook County paid holiday. And guess what? It passed unanimously. Now it's not just about a, a holiday, it's about we need to celebrate what our heritage is. Juneteenth is the official day that we was actually released from slavery. And that's why it's a Juneteenth day. I had never heard of it till I got down to Jackson State University. You got brothers like Cam Buckner and Curtis Tarver. Cam Buckner is a state rep, but he's also the, the head, the president of the, of the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus. That caucus, which a lot of divine members it makes up, those guys and women did a heck of a thing just this, this past month. They introduced and passed uh, three quarters of what they call a black agenda. The majority of them are Phi Beta Sigma, Omega Psi Phi, uh, Delta Sigma Theta, Alpha Phi Alpha, and AKA. Those are what Divine Nine organizations are doing. So when you ask what's the relevance, we're, we're creating pathways for our youth. There's a poem that all of you all learned when you were pledging in your pledge process uh, and, and whatever process, and it was called bridge building. Anybody remember that? And at the end of the day, we're all building bridges for those individuals who are to come behind us. 
whether you are omega, whether you are alpha, whether you are kappa, whether you are iota, whether you are sigma, this is about bridge building. So that's what I think our relevance is today. We're building bridges and making ways for the next generation. We really saw that in evidence in the last election, didn't we? Everybody we did. Yeah. We did. And that video of everybody marching to the polls. That's right. That was really, really powerful. Along those lines, let's talk about uh, how we're working with our sister organizations. The sisters are representing, but we we all doing this thing together. Who wants to speak to that? Well, I, I will. All I at think once. <laughs> The, the commission, I, I don't want to speak. The, the, the commissioner touched on it that um, we, we all have a common mission. And when we are competitive, we are competitive in doing good. Each organization is, yes. is measures itself and uh, develops bragging rights for doing trying to do the most good in uh, our community. And and certainly the election of the first woman, first African-American, first Asian vice president of the United States was a collective effort of all the uh, BGLO um, uh, fraternities and sororities. And um, we, you know, through um, <clears throat> the, the, through the Panhellenic Council uh, and the other Divine Nine umbrella organizations, we have uh, joint, um, activities and efforts and we um, and and it serves as a conduit where when one fraternity is having something or another sorority is having something everybody can know about it and come support and 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 I think one of the Im important things about our involvement in the community is communication amongst ourselves um, and and supporting each other and cheering each other on Mr. Jones, I, I think you're dying to say something. I see you there. No, it, you know, I, I, I think about that. You know, one of the things is we are all in this together. We all want to do things in our neighborhoods right. to, to, to uplift our neighborhoods. I know if, if I had something going on in my neighborhood, if the Sigmas did and I called Rufus, if I called any other uh, people on this panel, they're coming. Because not only do right. they want to be associated with doing good and in the hood, and we're going to outrace one another doing good. Uh, and, and, and just like when you talk about the election, what the fraternities and sororities have is we have an organization. And you know, to do anything, you have to have an organization. The fraternities and sororities are built in organizations that you can mobilize around activities or initiatives that's going to uplift our neighborhoods and our people. That's right. I mean, it's, it's our responsibility. That's part of pledging. Being in See, a fraternity would, sorority, that is our responsibility. And I would add to Cedric, Cedric's comments, you know, I think we've taken that camaraderie that you see on the college campuses and brought that into our community relationships as adults. And when we look at our service projects, I think we found opportunity to bring those together. I know Kappa's work with all of the sororities um, I recall during some of, over some of the years working with our Kappa League program uh, in Chicago, how we would team up with the Deltas with their Delta Gems programs, bring these young men and young women together That's and right. talk about issues like how to appropriately interface with law enforcement, uh, some of the pearls of wisdom around dating safety um, and other health related issues, because we wanted to find opportunities to have some synergy with the work that we're doing in communities. So I think we found those opportunities working with the sororities and honestly, even with the fraternities working together right. uh, as well. And there's a certain beauty to the Divine Nine because we continue after our, after our undergraduate years. And so mm -hmm. these organizations that have been developed in the brotherhoods and sisterhoods that have been developed continue on. Kappa Alpha Psi was founded on the principle of achievement. And so we find ourselves achieving in all fields of human endeavor and giving that back to our respective communities we don't see that in other, we don't see that in white fraternities and, and sororities, but for this divine nine, that's what we do. And we, we didn't jump in uh, on the question about our sister organizations because Cap Alpha Psi doesn't have a natural sister organization. We have done partnerships with everyone and those partnerships have all been good, whether those have been social things or whether they out and delivered food and done, uh, done other things around the city. Oh, I didn't mean literal sister organizations. I meant the, uh, the members of the divine nine, the, mm -hmm. the sisters 
people out there doing doing things. Yeah. We are bro, we are all family. Mm -hmm. Did you guys think when you first pledged that it will be this important to your future lives? You know what I mean? <laughs> when first it was it was there was a reason for pledging. It was and we all had them different various reasons. We saw what was happening around us and to us and for us. But did you have any idea that we have this lasting impact? Well, let me on your say life? this: when we pledged, yes, we did know it had a lasting impact on our lives, particularly particularly those of us who pledged undergrad. But um, <laughs> you know, given given what you sacrifice to get into these organizations and the meaning that it has over the weeks or months or however long of those pledge periods were, that was important. And I do know that as soon as we went over, the first thing they told us was that now you're a kappa, now the real work starts. And I looked at him like he had eight heads because I thought the real work was just out of hell week. But then to look and go on, and it, it ebbs and flows, Jose. So I was involved a lot when I was an undergraduate, involved a little bit when I got out of undergraduate and stepped away, but have reacclimated myself very much into the fraternity and very much into what we do going around. So it's something that sits firmly in my in my uh, in my spirit and once a cap, always a kappa, because, you know, as we say, many are called, but few are chosen. So it's a lot to, um, it's a lot of, of burden to carry. And I think it's, you know, I speak for us, but certainly these things are res that resonate through all of us who are in, in these That's organizations. Right. Brother uh, Jose, you know, this is my 40th year, you know. Wow. Uh, in nice. October, it will be 40 years with my ship, uh, USS Excalibur. Um, from 1981, I knew <clears throat> it would be a lifetime love, um, a, a, a lifetime of opportunity, uh, because even back then, uh, it was impressed upon me, and you pick up very easily, that um, this organization is about creating servant leaders. And I suspect that each of the fraternities and each of the sororities have the same mission of creating, building servant leaders. And, um, uh, and, and so it wasn't a matter of, uh, so I enjoyed Alpha walking as much as the next brother. And, and I was at the party at IIT, uh, the parties that New Row used to have, uh, and, and they were great times, um, but, you know, I I also knew that this was uh, this was a, a lifetime uh, opportunity, and um, and wouldn't have it any other way. You know, I had to actually get on a calculator to figure out how many years. <laughs> it's that big. Uh, it will be forty five as of this year. Mm. I don't even think I was at all this year. See, wow. <laughs> no. <laughs> We have some some uh, vital issues right now we're dealing with, especially right. COVID. I know some of the organizations, and uh, Derek, I know you've been involved a lot in the the COVID effort and, and helping our people. Talk to us about that. Sure. You know the Kappas have been involved in partnering with local organizations around giving away masks and helping make uh, COVID testing uh, more accessible and more affordable. And I think we all know that this is something that's really important. Um, there was, you know, a new uh, report out today that shows that, you know, life expectancy in the United States has dropped almost a year overall from January to June of 2020. That's right. And African-American community uh, has dropped even That's bigger. Right. And for African-American men, you know, compared to white men, their life expectancy dropped eight tenths of a year during the first wave of the pandemic. For African-American men, we lost three years of life expectancy just accounting for Janu deaths from January to June of last year. So that's not accounting for the second wave and the third wave. So we are really in the midst of a compelling high stakes public health emergency uh, and especially in uh, black and brown communities. And you're gonna see members across all of our fraternities represented today, as well as individuals that's who right. are not members of the Divine Nine, really working diligently to try to educate um, members of our communities to try to validate, acknowledge uh, many of the root causes of distrust that there are in our communities, but also making very clear the choices that we have before us as we think about getting vaccinated uh, against COVID-19 is having a detrimental impact 
uh, on all communities, but we are really seeing it hardest hit um, in the African American community and in our indigenous and uh, Latino communities. And that's built on many of the historic uh, injustices that we've seen that's throughout right. multiple structures of our society, whether it's education, right. housing, employment, healthcare, those things predated the pandemic. And we just see them really kind of blossom in a very ugly way during the pandemic. These are the type of things that members of our fraternities have been that's right. fighting for so, for so many years. That's right. And this didn't happen overnight. And so as we try to turn this ship back in the right direction, uh, we really got a lot of work to do. What do you guys see as the vital issues that we are fighting in addition to the pandemic today? Well, it's racism. It is, you know, injustices, just as Derek has indicated. I think this fight has been going on certainly for quite a while. And it is a fight, but but I see light at the end of the tunnel. So us as Divine Nines, uh, members of Divine Nine uh, organizations, have been fighting this in the middle of COVID, doing food drives, doing mm -hmm. uh, PP, PPE. Um, in fact, I just did, we just did something on PPP, you know, for those black owned businesses who are, um, need to get some of this free money that's out there uh, due to the pandemic, you know, get your paperwork together and get some of this money to help your business thrive, mm -hmm. which takes us to economic development. Uh, we want to ensure that economic development is paramount in the Black community. This is an opportunity for that to happen. Uh, it goes back to the old saying, the proverbial saying, each one, reach one. You know, mm -hmm. And so I think that we're doing that as organizations, and we, we certainly need to, to continue to do that. There's a lot of work ahead. No, I'll, say, I'll say, you know, our issues are deep, profound, profound and entrenched. And so there's so many things that have to happen, as Derek pointed out, as the commissioner pointed out. And, you know, it's racism, but, you know, it's also casteism. And this caste system that we fight against here in the United States always existed. Understanding that better, understanding what we have to do to dismantle that. That's right. How we continue to achieve these higher places. It's wildly exciting to have Kamala Harris sitting in the vice president's seat, because what we can see is four years from now, she should very well be sitting in the president's seat. And someone with that level of engagement, certainly in what we're talking about here and where we are, can help to dismantle some of these systems that exist. And it's these systems that have kept us in places that we can now go in and dismantle. With us in Divine Nine, the one thing that you always know when you see people wearing black Greek letters is that as a college educated person, that thing you know every time you see one of us. And we all know then we've all gone through some pretty difficult times. And these are people who you know can get you to the fire. And these are people who you know you can count on when things get really hard, they're not going to give up because we haven't given up in order to get to where we are. And so in these things that we look at going forward, this big fight against casteism, racism, all the things that perpetuate these issues, these disparities in health in our lives are the things that we will always continue to fight. And certainly for me, I look strongly at what we have to do in our education system and how we deal with this imbalance, but we've continued to have this achievement gap that will be made even greater when we come out of this uh, pandemic because we know that there are people who can't engage in the same way as others through distance learning or whatever that is because it was already there before we even had this pandemic. Is that the biggest challenge that you're gonna see? Ho Jose, when did, I just looked, saw some research the other day where in the black community, we spend about $2 trillion a year, but only about 6% of that stays in our neighborhood. So think about how much if we just stay, if half of that stayed in our neighborhood where we could create jobs, education, opportunities, and how it would change people's lives. So it's not that we don't have the economic power, we're just not placing it in the right places. So if, if we continue to educate and, and get the message out that we can, we have the resources, we just have to be strategic and purposeful about where we place and use those resources. That would make a significant change. So brother, brother Jose, um, you know, we are fighting on all fronts. Mm -hmm. um, and there, we are fighting both the systemic challenges with uh, racism, caste-ism, uh, Mm -hmm. um, um, and 
and economic, um, economic disinvestment. Uh, you see on the west side and the south side um, what has happened there uh, produces the challenges that we have now. The food deserts produce mm -hmm. the diabetes, the high blood pressure. Um, and, and so it's incumbent upon us to do programs like at Xi Lambda, we have a, we have a wellness challenge where, where all the brothers are, have signed up to, uh, to change behaviors in our families and we set up teams and, we, and individuals to attack these issues with exercise, with, um, um, with eating correctly, um, with other forms of wellness uh, so that we can impact our families and our communities in a positive way. But you know, these, are, these are symptoms that we're dealing with even as we are dealing with the systemic mm -hmm. problems associated with uh, how, this, how this nation came to get to this place where we are right now. Are you, are you optimistic or pessimistic as we look around today? I am optimistic. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm filled with hope. I think that we've come, we've gotten a lot done over the years and we have a lot to do and we can get it done. Each time, you know, this pendulum swings and I was certainly troubled last year as so many were with the murder of George Floyd. But what happened in that same time was that it opened so many eyes to the plight of black people over all of these years. And many of them may have seen it in slavery and may have understood what that was, but this has been a continuum since to this point. And so when you're marching around Lincoln, Park, you, adults who are saying black lives matter and 16 shots in the cover up, it gives me a sense that perhaps we do we, we've reached a different point and we can make some, some more monumental change. Yeah. A little bit, as, as, we, as we start to, to wrap up what's, what's been a really fast hour, I would love for you to uh, yes. go around and uh, start with you, Cedric, and talk to me about what this means to you, uh, your organization, being there and what you hope to accomplish and, and your, your legacy. What I, what I wanna do is, is, is I believe you know, we were founded, you know, back at Howard University, and now our first woman vice president graduated from Howard University, that we can continue to build on what we've done, educate our youth, provide opportunities back into our communities, be a face in our community, not, you know, not for it to stop with the partying and undergrad, but as alumni and as senior members of the community that we're continually striving to keep the name out there, to keep the programs going, to educate, to have these kind of panels, to, uh, to have coalition with the Divine Nine so that we can continue to uplift our community. So I'm very optimistic because again, I, I hate to say this because we got two alphas on here, but Martin Luther King said, I have a dream and, I, and he's, he is my hero. And so I will always have hope because that's what my foundation is. So, well, as as my as my brother Q says, <laughs> Dr. Reverend Jesse Jackson, keep hope alive. Yes, <laughs> we always do that. Uh, let's see, Commissioner. I'm gonna go to uh, start and uh, go with Derek. Any any final thoughts? Uh, your what you hope the legacy will be of the organization? Absolutely, Cap Alpha Size model of achievement has worked wonders for me. I like to describe myself as a turtle on a post, I didn't get there by myself. And so when I think about legacy for the fraternity and legacy for my membership, it's about really giving back to others in the community to help empower them and help them be as successful as they can. And I think that you know goes back to the fundamentals of our organization. Um, and I think it's consistent with the efforts of, of everyone on the call uh, today. So um, look forward to helping contribute to that legacy over time. Commissioner. Thank you so much. And I do, I agree with what's been said by the other brothers. There is a great legacy in Omega Psi Phi fraternity. And uh, what I'm most proud of is the great work that we've done up until this point. But also the fact, I think 
you know, we also have to make sure that we uphold our organizations. So I just became a life member of Omega Psi Phi. Now, while we uphold Omega Psi Phi or whoever, whatever organization we have, we have to ensure we then take those same cardinal principles and implement them into our communities. So I'm, I'm very excited about our future. Let's go, let's go there. I am also excited, brother. Um, you know, we, we, we all stand on great, big, strong shoulders. And, um, and we didn't get here without a lot of hard work, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, a lot of effort. Um, and so it is incumbent upon us. Uh, we owe it to mm -hmm. our ancestors and to our future descendants to, um, to take the baton that we've been given, to run hard, um, to, uh, to lift as we climb uh, and leave every door open for every young person. And if we do that, uh, focused on the, the challenges that we've discussed here, uh, in particularly economic development, um, you know, I can't help but be optimistic of for our future because it is in our hands. Uh, you know, people are going to do what they're going to do. Systems are going to do what they're going to do. But it really is in our hands. That's right. That's right. Buddy, how are you how are you feeling about all this what's happening right now and, and the legacy that you hope to leave behind? Now, Jose, one of the things that was one of the profound periods for me in the fraternity was when I went down to Bloomington, Indiana in uh, 2011 to celebrate our 100th anniversary. And to be down in that space and to think about what these 10 men did 100 mm -hmm. years earlier in the midst of the Ku Klux Klan, mm -hmm. in the midst of everything else. And, and no, Kappa was originally Kappa Alpha Nu, and we changed it. Kappa Alpha said, look at that, look at that Kappa Alpha Nig run. And so the brothers overhearing that shifted our name to Kappa Alpha Psi. So I think about what they dealt with 100 years ago and what we can do now. So our burden is heavy, but there's so much that we can do. I'm excited about our Guide Right program, our Capital League program, what we do to raise young men and identify these young high school men and move them forward through their lives and what we continue to do there. And the connections that we have with all these men on this call, which is just a, just a symbolic of the connections that we have with men throughout the country and certainly throughout the Divine Nine, is something that we know that we must do, we will do, and it gives me great, tremendous hope towards what we can do in the future. You, you bring up that. I didn't know about the name change. What, what misconceptions, gentlemen, do you think people have about Divine Nine organizations? Well, I think in many cases, people see us as elitist. Um, you know, we set ourselves as partners. And, um, you know, I don't know what, whether that's, people will perceive it however they do, but everybody has a choice to try and get into one of these organizations or not. I think what we see is uh, not counting what we see really in the, in the misconception is that we are all in competition when the fact of the matter is we are all striving ahead. Cedric mm -hmm. and I talked earlier about thinking back to the civil rights movement where mm -hmm. there was Dr. King, there was Je a, an Alpha, there was Jesse Jackson, a Q, there was Ralph Abernathy, a Kappa, That's right. there was John Lewis, an Omega, all together right there, all making it happen, all That's for right. the benefit of people. So the misconceptions, whatever they are, our real conception is that we continue to move us forward. Well, gentlemen, it has been indeed a pleasure for me to, to be with you, to be a part of you, and to, just to be able to, as we say, to fellowship together, yes, even yes, virtually. Yes. And, uh, we must do this more often because uh, there is strength in numbers, and uh, we didn't get here alone, and we've got a long way to go. I appreciate you your being here and sharing some insights with us and with our viewers here at ABC7. Uh, we, we like to reach out and see what's really happening. And we know you are part of organizations and individually 
that make those things happen and do great things for our city and for our world. On behalf of everybody here at ABC7, y'all know y'all got a home at ABC7, as long as we there, and we plan to be there for a while. For all of us at ABC7, thank you for being with us. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. And thank you, thank you. Home thank you. for being a part thank of you. our Thanks Chicago. So <laughs> we'll see you next time. <laughs> Everybody, <laughs> come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Yes, sir. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Appreciate, Appreciate you, man. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Diana. <laughs>